Okay, good morning from Brazil. My name is Helena Chutinses Aguil Lopes. I'm from the Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, and this is section 10, PD. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Irene Fonseca. Irene Fonseca is the Kavchich Moda University Professor of Mathematics at Carnegie Mellon University and the Director of the Center for Nonlinear Analysis. Originally a specialist in positive convexity in the calculus of variations, she is now a very broad applied mathematician. Her research is interdisciplinary and concerns mathematics of material science, set phase transitions, and imaging problems. She has done a huge amount of service to the community and to the profession, including being past president of SIAM. Irene Fonseca is a fellow of the AMS, a SIAM fellow, and a fellow of the European Academy of Sciences. In 2022, she was awarded the prestigious International Society for the Interaction of Mechanics and Mathematics Senior Prize. Today, she will speak on phase separation in heterogeneous media. Irene, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elena, for the introduction, and uh, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, and indeed, I will talk about the interplay between phase transitions and homogenization. So uh, to give you a short overview of uh, what is the plan of my talk, I will start with a brief introduction to the kant hilliard model for phase transitions. Um, and then the, the first two topics will have to do with the quasi-static analysis of uh, phase transitions in, of heterogeneous media. Um, the first one will be the critical case where you have phase transitions and homogenization basically occurring at the same speed, if you wish. Um, and that's work with uh, Ricardo Cristofori, uh, Adrian Haggerty, and Cristina Popovici. It appeared already in the first century boundaries. Um, and then the second topic could be the same, but now we'll have moving wells. It will be in the subcritical uh, case regime where phase transitions occur faster than homogenization. That's work with Ricardo Cristofoli and uh, Likin Canedi. Um, part of it has been submitted already uh, and uh, some of it is still in progress. I may not have time to do then the dynamics, the evolution uh, of this model, which essentially it's Alan Kahn. Um, uh, that would be in the critical case. And, but if I do have time, that is work with uh, Rasam Shoksi, Jessica Lin, uh, Raghav Venkatraman. Uh, part of it has been, or has already appeared in Kalkvar, uh, and part of it is in progress. And then I'll wrap up with what's next and open problems. So um, as a brief introduction to Khan Hilliard, here we are going to model um, phase transitions between, say, two uh, materials uh, by means of considering an energy that I depict here as uh, I of u, u will be the phase field um, of an integral of omega, omega is the container, uh, w will be the potential energy, uh, and here um, as a simple prototype, uh, you would like to live, say, in, in two phases, u uh, minus one or u equal to one, that will be the two materials if you wish. Um, they will have to be combined uh, and they will be combined because I'm going to fix that I want a, a, a fixed volume fraction. So M will be say a, 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 a combination between wells at minus one and wells at one. In general, of course, it will be wells at say A and B. Uh, and uh, so these will be the two phases of the fluid. And, um, and again, so I will fix the, how much of one fluid I want versus the other, right? Now, if I just leave it like that, of course, we have an enormous non-limited of solution because any U that takes just values A or B, um, say A on a portion E of omega and B on the complement, will be, of course, of zero, zero uh, energy, provided that the, the volume fraction is observed, and that only has to do with the volume of the set E, right? And so going back to Kahn and Healy and those of van der Waals, one way of addressing this non-uniqueness is to say, well, okay, so inside my omega, I'll have pockets of A's and B's, but let me then penalize the interfacial energy. So when I jump from one phase to the other, and I'll do that by considering um, the gradient of you, uh, which of course is going to be different from zero when you go from one phase to the other. So you can look at this as the surface energy penalization. Epsilon is going to be a very small parameter. Epsilon is exactly 
uh, if you wish, is the width of the transition layer when you go from phase A to phase B. Now, Gerton conjectured that if you leave it like this, and if you look and if you consider your epsilon to be a minimizer of this energy, he, he, he conjectured that these U epsilons actually in the limit, they will select preferred solutions of these, um, of these what I call USAPs, in that the U epsilons will converge uh, to uh, some particular U uh, E zero, where among all these um, uh, designs uh, of, of these inclusions is, this E zero, will actually minimize the perimeter among all possible designs E, again, fixing with the right volume fraction. Uh, so this is just, if you wish, is the surface area of E0. So if this is omega, uh, and if this is E, that would be just uh, the part of the interface inside omega. Or if you wish, say, if, if you were like here, you just consider the part inside the container, not the, the, the area of the container. Now, the way, one way in the Gauss of variations to make this more precise is to use the notion of um, gamma conversions going back to the Georgie. And uh, this was formalized vigorously by Modic and Mortola in the 70s and then later on in the 80s. In that what you do, well, if you leave it like this, these have order epsilon, they go to zero. So you don't see anything. So you, 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 you scale these by epsilon. I call that now F epsilon, that would be now of order one. And you prove that these energies gamma converge, and I'll tell you in a second, for those of you who are not familiar with that concept, to an energy, to a limiting energy F. And F does exactly the right thing in that the fields U will then have just two values. They are bundled variation functions from omega with values just A or B. Uh, there will be just a perimeter of there where u is equal to i inside omega. That's the same as the perimeter where u is equal to b inside omega. It's the same. With a certain uh, 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 factor, which I call CW. CW in this case is explicitly calculated like so. Um, and you can think of this as actually being um, uh, a surface energy which is iso so, so the surface energy that is isotropic, it's a constant. So you pull that out. So you, you can write this as the boundary of a zero of CW. Um, it's, it's a surface integral. And then you pull out that because it's isotropic. It does not depend on the normal to the interface. Okay. The good news is that in terms of minimizers, which is what you're trying to analyze, uh, the minimizers of this and the minimizers of that energy are exactly the same. So you're not messing up the minimizers in future. So let me just very briefly uh, remind you what is the notion of gamma convergence. So you have functionals F epsilon, you have a limiting functional F. What we mean by F epsilon as functionals converging to F, um, the spaces are not necessarily the same because you see for F epsilon, you probably need to consider U to be Sobolev at least, to be even smooth at C1, but Sobolev is fine. While the limiting uh, uh, um, space is not going to be Sobolev, it's going to be BV. So that's why I have here exceptions and I have here. These are not necessarily the same spaces. And so you say that F epsilon gamma converge to F if two properties occur. The first one is that Every time that you have U epsilons converging to you in some topology, say L1 or L2, F of U is below the limit F of the energies. And you cannot do better because uh, given a U in the target space, you can find a sequence living in, the, in this space, in, in, the, in the more smooth space. That, that's actually called the recovery sequence in that actually f of u is bigger than equal to the limit soup. Of course, if you put these two together, that means that here you have equality. So it's tight. You cannot do better. Um, and a very important property of this notion of gamma convergence is that global minimizers of the approximating uh, 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 energies do converge to global minimizers of the limiting energy. So if we know uh, what is the gamma limit of these energies, then you have a selection criterion because we know that minimizers of, of these uh, uh, smoother, uh, regularized energies 
converge to now uh, a minimizer of f. But of course, the bottom line is that you, you, you should know how to characterize explicitly what this gamma limit is. Okay, and so indeed that's a theorem that says that yes, indeed, if you start with this scaled energy, it gamma converges to exactly what was uh, the conjecture, which is it's a constant times the perimeter of the phase where u is equal to a inside omega, the same as the perimeter where u is equal to b inside omega. And as I said, the constant is explicitly calculated in this way here in, in this setting. Okay, now, um, this is a non-exhaustive list of references. Many, uh, there are many more references, which uh, unfortunately will have to be uh, considered in the dot, dot, dot down here. Uh, many people have worked on these problems or related problems using different techniques. Um, I would like in particular to um, point out the work of Guy Bouchité, where he had actually moving wells, and I come back to that later on, uh, and it was coupled. Uh, the the well here you can think of this as uncoupled right you have the double of you the potential is here and the regularization is that's decoupled um and then uh well we then uh, with uh, my former student christina popovici we basically generalized bushiti for the vector valued case uh but you can also consider cases where you have higher order gradients for example if you study uh the phase transitions for for a say elastic materials right uh, in which case the phase field now is, is replaced by the, the deformation rate. Okay, so that's all fine, except that now we are interested in settings in which actually heterogeneities of the medium are important. And in order to model those situations, the potential W as well as the wells should actually depend on position. And one particular uh, setting is, for example, when you study lipid drafts, and in that case, um, uh, it is known that you should have heterogeneous media. And what is interesting here, and I will remind you of that later on, is that when in the end, you're going to observe that as opposed to what I talked about before, that modica mortula, where you end up with a surface energy of some um, uh, surface energy density. In this case, there's no microscopic phase separation. You're gonna get a bulk energy and the phase separation actually it occurs at the nanometer scale. I'll come back to that later on. And here, uh, this again, this is in the lipid drafts literature. You can see here a cartoon of the homogenization process, which ends up uh, in the end, there is a transition to an homogeneous material, as you can see here. That's what here you have the separation of phases. Okay, so that's fine. So uh, in our language, what this means is that uh, you should, the W that, that that translates into which phases you are preferring should depend on where you sit in your. Um, in, in your container, it depends on position. Not only that, but it could actually have a mixture that occurs at a faster and faster uh, speed, if you wish, although this is in the quasi-static regime. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is that the wells where, where this is zero should, should depend on position. So you're now going to have moving wells depending on X and fast. So delta goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. In addition to that, a prototype uh, uh, that you may have in mind is one in which, um, say, uh, at each x, uh, you could have like a w1 and a w2, um, and, and inside of your inside your cell Q, say, which is a unit cube, in part of that cell you you, you have a potential w1. In the complement, you have a potential w2. Why do I bring that up? because there's a prototype and optimal design problem in which you can see that the dependence on X should only be measurable. You should not assume more than just measurable. As you can see here, it's karatadori, if you wish, in terms of X and P, but not smooth in X. Okay, so again, what is the goal? The goal is to uh, identify what is the gamma limit of these energies. Now, um,
Again, so let's look at the Duchenne's phases, wells depending on A of X and B of X. Uh, so depending on position, without homogenization, so that means when delta epsilon was one, which of course is not what we're gonna do because we want delta epsilon going to zero. Um, but if you had a one in there, then there was work before done by Bushiti. Uh, it was in the scalar case. So he was using basically um, convexity duality, which cannot be, uh, as far as I know, extrapolated to the vector valid case. That was then done in 2021 by at least Tafferi and Gravina, vectorial case, um, no homogenization. Uh, and the assumption you do else was very uh, strict in that they had to assume that it was exactly quadratic, that the, the, the Ws were exactly quadratic uh, near the wells. Uh, okay, so that was, uh, as far as I know, what was done until now. So now let's look at what we have, what we have done. So let's start with fixed wells. Uh, so I'm going to assume that P, uh, this is zero depending on A when P is A and B, but not A and B are constant. They don't depend on X, but it will have homogenization. Okay, so basically you're, you're here, right? I'm gonna have homogenization, but this is zero when U is A or B, not dependence on X. So that was in the critical case where you go basically in tandem homogenization with a phase a transition, uh, we proved that uh, the, the limit um, uh, energy is indeed an interface over the boundary of the where u is equal to a of a certain surface energy density. Uh, this is just a Hausdorff measure in our end, so surface measure if you wish. Um, and sigma, sigma, well, sigma before was a constant. Remember that I told you it was explicit. Here it's given by a cell formula, and I'll go over that in a second. But what is interesting though, is that it can be shown that this sigma is an isotropic. Uh, and usually, and, and that's, that's unexpected because usually you get an isotropy in these problems from the penalization that you put for interfacial energy. That's the original integral. It's completely isotropic. It does not see the direction uh, of, of the normal at the interface, right? And still, uh, you're going to get um, a surface energy density that's anisotropic. And it can be shown that's exactly anisotropic unless you don't have an homogenization effect. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you in a second what, what, is, um, what, what is the cell formula. Um, prior to our work, there's work by Ancini, Brides, Kadopiat, um, where uh, there, uh, which was different because their W did not depend, the W was not, did not oscillate. What oscillate first was uh, where they had the homogenization was in the, um, in the surface energy density. And that is a completely different phenomenon because what we have here is a competition here between W that wants to be at the wells a and B together with this fast homogenization. And so it's a completely different phenomenon. The formulas are different, the analysis is very different. The techniques are, are completely diverse. So it's, it's a fundamentally different phenomenon. Okay, let me go back to what's, what is sigma. So again, you have an interface. So, so zoom in your interface, you have a normal mu. Uh, then you put uh, your cube that is oriented with two phases perpendicular to mu. Um, and then uh, what you do is you're going to basically um, uh, look at the fast variable homogenized, so now it becomes a microscopic variable. You take that Q, Q mu and then you multiply by a large t, t goes to infinity. Um, going back to Stefan Mueller, we know that homogenization vector valued cases, we need to take cells bigger and bigger and bigger. It does not suffice to take just one cell. Again, we uh, expect that what's going to happen will be just near the interface. And then um, beyond that, you're going to be, have just, just B or A. And so the energy is zero. And so you have to scale by interfacial energy. And uh, so these are the cells that are going fast. And you infimize over functions 
which basically would like to look like B and A, um, except you cannot quite do that because these are not H1. So you, you modify uh, this function, which is B and A, you modify it and you, you ask your fields U to look like those uh, on the boundary, okay? The trace looks like that. What the modifier is, it's immaterial. The formula does not depend on the choice of modifier. Okay, now why do you get an isotropy? And an isotropy, uh, the source of an isotropy is the following. Suppose that you are so lucky that your normal uh, is oriented according to one of the periodicity directions of your uh, bulk energy W, which says the orthonormal basis of our N, right? Then what you do is across the interface, you're going to tile with copies of the cell. Uh, and in, one, in each one of these yellow cube, you just put copies of the, of the recovery sequence. Um, and they add up. While if it's skewed, like this case, then the problem is that in that case, this is not the sum of the energy in each one of the cubes. So that's why it gives you the, the anisotropy. In terms of the roadmap to prove this, well, that's um, the typical roadmap in that you first prove compactness. That is, if you have a sequence of with bounded energy, then you have a subsequence which converges in the BV setting to a function that only takes values on the bottoms of the wells. And then, and then you have to go back to the definition of gamma convergence. And you know that I took play, two parts to it, if you recall. One is to prove you have a gamma limitif, and then the second part is to prove that you have a recovery sequence. Normally, the recovery sequence, once you get the gamma limitif, which is usually the harder part, um, you have a cell formula, and then using rescaling arguments, you can prove a recovery and, and the blow up method, you can prove a recovery sequence very easily. Um, here it's exactly the opposite. The gamma limitif was kind of easy. The cell formula was not very hard to, to figure out. And those of you who work on homogenization and, and similar problems or in phase transitions, you would have guessed that this is the right formula. What is harder is actually uh, to prove uh, that you can find a recovery sequence. And the challenge here is exactly that you have two competing effects, oscillation and concentration. So, uh, let me go very, very briefly over uh, this part here. How, how, do, how do you construct this recovery sequence? And uh, now again, the transition layer, this, if the transition layer is aligned with the principal axis, that's easy. And I will not go over that, but because as I said, you just take that cell formula and you tile over um, the, the, the interface of, of that Q, Q nu or, or or scales of the or scaled versions of the cube mu, that's that's relatively easy. And suppose that now it's it's not aligned. Well, the first observation is that actually um, is that actually you have many more directions with respect to which W is periodic. And it turns out that if you have a normal that has that's so it's a unit normal, norm one, and it has rational uh, um, entries, then if you find, if you take that Q, Q nu, right, uh, oriented like that, and if you scale it appropriately with a very, very large uh, integer number, then actually W square is still going to be periodic with respect to this skewed cube. And the good news is that these are actually dense uh, on the initial. Um, and so when you, and once you have that, then you can go back and use sort of the same construction you use for this case, you can now use for this case, but now with these particular uh, oriented cubes. Now you prove uh, that uh, our sigma is well-defined, it's finite. You prove that it does not depend on the choice of that modifier on the boundary. You prove it's upper semi-continuous. Actually in the end, it's going to be the surface energy density of a gamma limit, which has to be lower semi-continuous. So actually the upshot is that it's actually going to be convex. So it's going to be continuous, but you don't know that yet. So by hand, 
you prove that this upper symmetry continuous. And um, okay, so then as I said, if you now have one of these good normals, uh, you 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 use those scales that look like so, as I told you before, and and you produce recovery sequences for polyhedral sets which have the facets with good normals, normals in that set that are called lambda. And remember, lambda is just these. It's uh, unit normals with rational integers. So how do you wrap up? Well, you wrap up by saying, OK, so if now I take a generic Q, uh, BV with values A and B, I can first, as a density result, approximate it by a sequence such that these, um, the sets where this is, say, say the phase A, it's actually a polyhedral set with good normals. So these are good normals. Um, they converge to U in L1 strong. The total variations converge to the total variation. Now you use Rechet Nyak's theorem that says, oh, but then since sigma is upper semi continuous, I now have um, uh, this inequality. But on the other hand, now these are good normals. And before, I told you that for these ones, I know how to produce recovery sequences. So for each one of them, I have a recovery sequence. Then you put these two together, you diagonalize, and you get a good recovery sequence for your original one. That's the usual, uh, um, that's the usual method to using density results for this kind of problems. OK, now let me look at the case where um, you now have the subcritical case where epsilon goes to zero much faster than delta. It's essentially here. You take a sequence, epsilon and delta n. So essentially you are going to a phase transition. You're going to need a facial energy first, but still with an homogenization process um, happening in the background. Um, and say, suppose you can, you don't need to have two phases. You could have k phases. Uh, again, remember, you jump from one into the other in a, in a measurable way, not a continuous way. Um, you have the usual periodicity. And so you're going to consider now these energies, right? Um, and, and now I'm going to assume that the wells are moving. So for each P, so P will depend, uh, and, and for each one of them, it depends on AIs and BIs, and that can change with I. Um, the behavior near the wells is that, okay, first of all, I will not necessarily assume that these wells are well separated. Of course, before when they were constant, they were well separated, there's an A and a B, right? But here I can even assume that they, they mix, that they are, that, that, that there is a, a, a coexisting zone of, of these two wells. Um, and I will assume that if I'm away from the wells, that I have basically quadratic wells, but not necessarily exactly quadratically. And here again, with compared to uh, without homogenization, what Christopheri and Gravina did without homogenization was exactly quadratic. They had to have an equality here. And so same thing for the A's and for the B's. And then if you go very, very far in U, you can assume that it's essentially quadratic at infinity. That's a harmless uh, uh, hypothesis. It's, it's very far out. And without uh, scaling, so uh, just remember the Fs for me are the scaled, the Is are without scaling. So without scaling, let's look at that so-called zeros um, or the result, and you prove that, um, well, if I have a a sequence with bound and energy, they converge in L2 to some function um, in L2 weak. Uh, they converge to some function in L2. Um, and, and the gamma limit is going to be what we expect, just homogenization of W. And this is the usual formula for the homogenization of W. And the use that you, that you obtain will have a mixture of the wells in this way. So that's, that's how they they mix the two wells. Okay. Um, I should say that uh, Frankfurt and Mueller, they addressed uh, also the zeroth order uh, with one gradient uh, more, so one derivative more. Uh, our proof actually extends to, to, that, to that setting, of course. 
um, but it uses completely different methods. We use two scale methods, and so um, we believe they're somewhat simpler. Um, okay, so, so that's the zeroth uh, order. So next, you, you would like to go in the gamma limit, uh, say, Taylor expansion, what is the next one? And the next one, you have to first see how this uh, energy scale, right? So I know that minimizes for these who have energy zero, they will be, if I plug this into that, I get energy zero. Um, and so you do a back of the envelope calculation, which uh, to see what is the microstructure that occurs in each periodic cell. And uh, again, it's a back of the envelope calculation and you'll find out that it is basically a scaling like an epsilon over delta. You scale by that. And again, you see that you have like a can Hilliard kind of scaling appearing. This is harmless because it goes to zero and you have exactly the, 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 the inverse of that here and the inverse of that there. So it looks again like a modica mortal distribution, can heal you, uh, kind of scale. So you know that you have to divide by that, which you do. Uh, and now you're going to have an energy of order one. So you scale by that, this is what you get. And again, the question is, what is the gamma limit? And the first thing that we did was we used the so called unfolding operator, which it uh, goes back to Ceranesco, Damani, and Rizzo, uh, and independently by Vizintin, uh, which, which takes the fast variable and unfolds it to make it essential to render it as a macroscopic variable now on the cell of the periodicity, which is so. So Y lives in Q and the axes live in omega as before, that's the container. I won't go through the details of the unfolding operator, but. Um, they have several interesting properties, in particular with respect to uh, two scale uh, convergence, uh, which is what we're going to use in this setting. Um, now, in order to see how you connect these wells, you have to uh, consider geodesic energy. Uh, and for that, I define a function chi, which uh, basically tells me if I am in one of these. Uh, E1, E2, E3, where I have energies W1, W2, W3, et cetera, up, up to WK. Um, it's, it's, uh, this is a function of special boundary variation. So it has a singular set. It has a jump set. And there I define a geodesic di distance that says that if I want to connect, if, if I'm on position Y, um, uh, and if I want to connect a P to a Q using my energies, I do basically geodesic in that I go from minus one to zero. Um, I use, uh, say, suppose that, I, that, that uh, on the left, I was on phase I, on the right, I was on phase J. So I use the energy WI up to zero, then I use the energy WJ um, between zero and one. Of course, what is zero, it's important here because I don't know where, where I'm crossing. And so this, this admissible, class of, um, of geodesic uh, of curves depends also when I cross zero. So you see it depends on Z zero, depends on P and the Q, and it connects P to Q. So uh, we proved that indeed this, uh, the energy gamma uh, to scale convergence in the sense of gamma convergence to a limiting energy, which uh, looks like so. And now I remind you that when I mentioned lipid drafts, you may recall that I said, uh, it's observed that you don't have phase separation at the microscopic level. Indeed, you don't. You see, because this is a volume integral. And it's uh, and unless, unless you don't have homogenization, this is a volume integral, it's, and it does not separate. Uh, the separation is uh, done at the level, at this level. And here, indeed, you go over the jump set of a field V and V goes say from a V minus to a V plus, which would be one of the AIs and one of the BIs. Uh, and you use that geodesic distance to connect them. But there's no phase separation at the microscopic uh, limit. And that's basically what I'm telling you here. At first order, uh, you see uh, local phase separation, which occurs at this level, but not the microscopic phase separation. That is the first 
or the gamma limit. And I can say, well, what is the second one now? Okay, because now you expect a phase separation at the next order. But when you do a Taylor expansion using a convergence, what you do, you're going to have to take your energies, subtract the zero of F1, scale by the property of scaling, and then take the gamma limit. The problem is that before we knew that the zeros um, that, the, that the minimizers were actually of energy zero, right? That's what I told you before. Now, the minimizers of this energy here will not necessarily have energy zero. So I, I don't know by which I should subtract. And indeed, th so this can be non-zero. And so I, I don't know what to subtract. And actually, you can prove that this minimum is uh, this minima um, are zero, if and only if the, the, the periodic extensions of these of these wells uh, uh, are, are continuous, and you don't want that, right? You'd like them to be just measurable. So um, so we don't know. We don't know how, how to continue. Not at this point. Um, okay. So then. Um, Technical challenges. Well, you have the presence of two scale variables. The wells can be discontinuous. Uh, we, with our work, we extended to the case of the homogenization the work of Christopher and Gravina, which did sharp interface. They had a sharp interface result, but again, they had no homogenization. Also, in their case, they, they had exactly quadratic behavior at the wells. And by doing that, they could um, control the geodesic length because in that case, just a line. And here it's most of the work in our case goes exactly in, in, in controlling the length of these geodesics. Um, and also they had well-separated wells. We don't have well-separated wells. Okay, um, I don't have a lot of time left. I, uh, maybe I'm gonna use five more minutes and then I'll stop. Uh, but I just wanted, I told you that I probably won't have time and I will not have time to talk about the, the evolution problem, uh, which is uh, basically the gradient flow uh, corresponding to the energies we're discussing. So I'll probably just go very fast over two slides or so. And uh, anyway, the work mm -hmm. has uh, appeared recently, so, so you can find it in uh, uh, Calcvar. Uh, and so here, uh, again, you can see the gradient flow, um, which is essentially this, uh, this disclaimer in that before we had uh, uh, our energies were coupled. It was a W of X over epsilon comma U. Here, we have to consider them completely decoupled. It has to be A of X times W of U. The wells here are not moving, for example, are actually one and minus one. And this is what's going to oscillate. So, um, so our work um, concerns exactly this situation. Uh, and you start with the well-prepared uh, initial condition. So basically, your epsilon is the recovery sequence for a set of finite perimeter <coughs> E. And then you take just natural boundary conditions on the parabolic boundary um, of, of your domain. Uh, and um, just uh, credit when credit is due, when A is equal to one, of course, this is a very well-known um, problem. It's been studied in many different places, in many different techniques. This is one list of references. Um, I should say that um, at, at the end of the day, you always obtain that uh, the, the solutions, uh, your epsilons will converge to solutions of some notion of generalized mean curvature flow, basically normal velocity, which is the derivative of the normal to the interface is proportional in some way to the mean curvature of the interface. Um, but of course we have many different techniques to, to do that. Our approach was basically the geometrical measure theory mm -hmm. approach we used um, ideas by Ilmana and Mugnai and Roger, Roger Schatzel, Sato Konegawa. Okay. Uh, and uh, 
and of course, this is a modernization dream, right? How, how can you identify what is what kind of solution you solves, and uh, how is that this fact that now you have this uh, homogenization, this fast variable there? How does that influence the limit? Um, and uh, okay, uh, and with this, I'm going to probably just wrap up to tell you that okay, we have some work on that, um, and and. Basically, uh, I just want to go now over open problems. That was the energy we had before, correct? Uh, remember, epsilon, you have to think of epsilon as the width of the transition layer. Delta is the scale of the chronicity. And you may be calling that back of the envelope calculation that I told you that delta over epsilon is the energy of the microscopic patterns that oscillate around the moving wells. So what would be the next step? Well, um, as I said, in the case where epsilon goes to zero much faster than delta, we don't know what is the next, uh, 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 the next gamma expansion because we don't know what that, the minima of the first one. Now, when delta goes to zero much faster, that means homogenization first and then phase transition for fixed wells that was done by Haggerty uh, in this regime, and now with Christopheri and Liquid, we can now do the full case. Um, then for moving wells, um, uh, we believe that this is actually, this, this scaling is important. And the reason is just because when you work that out, this is what you, you can rewrite it like this. And again, that's a competition between um, the phase transition with the microstructure. And then, of course, you have uh, other regimes, and, and at the end of the day, stochastic homogenization, correct? So I think that I've used uh, my time, and I would like to stop here. I think it's a good place to stop. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Irene, for a, a really beautiful talk. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to all who have been watching this talk. Uh, unfortunately, we do not really have the means or time for uh, to take questions, but all participants are welcome to use the Discord service set up by uh, the IMU and the virtual ICM to post their questions. And Irene will be uh, online to answer them through the Discord channel. Okay, thank you very much. And with this, uh, we end.